Good evening, and thank you for that spirited introduction. I do often say that the young people I work with were a lot like me when I was their age. So what uh, you know now is that I'm a teacher at Barrington High School. And what you may not know, or many of you don't know, is that I'm also a Barrington High School dropout. I dropped out in November of my senior year. And the reason I dropped out, well, are many. I was immersed in, in the pits of self-defeating behaviors and self-defeating thoughts and beliefs about myself and the world around me. I believed I was a victim to life's circumstances. I had this internal dialogue going that I wasn't going anywhere, that being in school didn't mean anything, that what this school was trying to teach me didn't matter to me. I was in the work program, learning how to be a welder. And I thought that that was gonna be okay. That being a welder was, would be a good job. And so, in the fall of my senior year, I decided that I had had enough. And I walked out of here and didn't come back until I became a teacher. So I wanna talk a little bit about emotional intelligence because I was not exhibiting very much emotional intelligence when I was 17 years old. I also want to talk about our IQ. So it's our IQ and our EQ, and of course everybody in here knows about IQ. You probably know what your IQ score is, what it was when you were a teenager, when you were in middle school, or when you were in college. Most everybody was tested. But we don't talk too much about our emotional intelligence. We don't talk too much about what's commonly referred to today as our EQ. I'm glad we finally started to have a dialogue about emotional intelligence because I think it's way more important than our intelligence quotient. Because behind our emotional intelligence are our thoughts about ourselves and our beliefs about ourselves and where we fit into the world. There are three great thinkers that I I want to cite quotes on if I can figure out how to use this. Three great world thinkers had a lot to say about the difference between thoughts and events. The first one was Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. We are what we think. With our thoughts, we make the world. The Buddha. And the last one, maybe I can go back? Okay. Okay, good. Last one was William Shakespeare from the play Hamlet. For there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. I have fun with this one in class because I kind of switch it out a little bit. The kids hate it because I get a little sing-songy just for humor. And I'll say something like, things are neither good nor bad, but thinking makes itself. And then I'll repeat it. Things are neither good nor bad, but thinking makes itself. And I have some students in the audience, they hate it when I do that. I usually just get a collective groan, like, please stop. <laughs> So after dropping out of high school, <coughs> I knocked around for about a year. And, uh, and then I met a girl. And she inspired me. And she motivated me. She inspired me to re-engage myself as a learner, which I had not been for a very long time. And with that inspiration, I motivated myself to commit to studying for my GED. That was sort of, kind of like maybe the beginning of me rising above the surface. I had spent many years living below the surface. And so, with the help of a tutor, over a period of about six months, I studied for my GED, passed the test, and went on to college. And during those college years, I also married my girl. She happens to be here tonight in the audience. The love of my life. Ooh. 
So after the GED and after those years of college, I went into the private sector. And I rose up through the ranks and became a window office guy and a vice president of a commercial real estate and development company. During those years, with all the success that I was having, I was pretty good at what I did. The financial rewards were obvious. What I was doing was ringing hollow. I didn't think I was living true. There wasn't any meaning and purpose in what I was doing. I didn't have the passion that I thought I should have to live an authentic life. And so I would sit in the office of one of my business partners and I would tell her, you know, I'm gonna go back to school and I'm gonna teach. So I went back to college again, and I got my teaching credential, and I came back to Barrington High School. But it wasn't to teach the traditional subjects, although I could. It was to work with young people who were a lot like me when I was their age. Young people who were facing a lot of challenges in their lives. In my life growing up, I, uh, I lived in a family that was riddled with, well, we were fractured and we were dysfunctional and we were riddled with alcohol abuse and domestic violence. And it took its toll. So when I came back to teach, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to work with young people who were facing similar challenges. And so that's what I've been doing. I'm in my third decade now. And what I do is I work with young people, young men and women, to try and teach emotional intelligence, to try and work on their, their EQ, to try and teach them the importance of making the connection between our thoughts and our emotions and our behavior. And to teach that disconnect between life's events and how we react to those events. And that's a difficult process. It's tough for young people to disconnect from the event. We've learned to always blame others. We've learned to live our lives as a victim. I certainly did myself. It was always somebody else's fault. So I try and teach, take young people from an external locus of control to an internal locus of control to teach that thoughts, create emotions that result in behavior every time, regardless of the event, as opposed to tying their reactions to the event. To separate themselves from the event, as these great thinkers were talking about, the event is neutral. It's a tough thing to do because to, to accept that principle is to then have to accept responsibility for our behavior, and that's a difficult thing, especially for young people. Because they know if they take responsibility for their behavior, or for their thoughts and emotions and decisions that they have to take responsibility for their behavior. And as a young person, too many of us are not willing to do that. But it's an important connection. And so, in the process, my goal is to try and teach young people to learn enough about themselves to where they can learn to start accepting themselves. You know, self-acceptance is huge. Positive feelings of self-worth are huge. And if I can get them there, then maybe, just maybe, they can learn how to take their own best advice. Maybe they can learn how to forgive themselves. Because self-forgiveness is everything. You know, we're full of forgiveness when, when it comes to forgiving ourselves. I think everybody in here would agree that's a tough order. So let me tell you about three students. I was in class one day and I asked the class, why is it so difficult for us to take our own best advice? And I had this young man in the back 
he said, he pondered that for a moment. I was, I was watching him think it through, and he said, Mr. Palmer, I think it's because we don't like ourselves as much as we like other people. And I mean, that insight, that wisdom coming from this young, this particular young man just blew me away. And I wish that he would have, in fact, taken his own best advice. Because he was killed in a motorcycle accident. And I know that if he was giving advice to a friend of his, he would have said, don't ride your crotch rocket on a country road at 125 miles an hour. Please don't do that. He did not take his own best advice. And that afternoon, he lost his life. And he left two children behind. It's truly a tragedy. The next student I want to talk about is a young man who was gifted with, he was a handsome young man. And he came to school every day and he dressed in the best clothes that he could afford. And he fixed his hair just so. He was very proudful of the way that he looked. He took great pride in his appearance. He worked out, he ate right, but I knew he was lost. And so I took him down the hall one day and I walked him into the boys' room. And I stood him in front of the mirror. And I said, I want you to look at yourself. And I want you to look into your eyes. And I want you to forgive yourself. And he looked at me and he said, Mr. Palmer, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to do that. And to this day, I think he's still lost. I see him from time to time. I see him at the fitness center from time to time. And he still works out and still takes care of himself. But I think he's still lost. He's still living below the surface. The last student I want to mention is a young woman who was blessed with absolute beauty. <laughs> One day she came into class. She had colored her hair an auburn color. The color of the auburn that was popular in the 1940s. And she had her hair up in a bun, off to the side. And that was a classic, fashionable look in the 1940s. The bun up off to the side, and that color that she was wearing that day, ruby red lipstick. Mascara, eyeliner, eyebrow and pencil, just perfect. And she was wearing these earrings. They were not pierced. They were clip-ons. And I can tell she got it from a second-hand store. And we were sitting and talking. And I knew I had to say something. But a male teacher has to be really careful in complimenting a female student in a high school setting. But I knew I had to say something. And so I looked at her and I said, I've just got to tell you something. And she looked at me back and I said, I just have to tell you that you look absolutely elegant today. And she smiled. And then she took her hands to her earrings. And she said, it's the earrings. <laughs> and that just made me laugh. It was just one of those funny, pure moments, you know. And those are kinds of moments that you just never forget. When I'm sitting on my front porch, I'm in my rocking chair with a blanket over my lap, I'm going to think about that girl and what she said that day. But I'm also going to think about this. The next day in class, I'm talking about self-forgiveness. Talking about taking ourselves off the hook for our past transgressions, for the mistakes that we've made, for our fallibility, for our propensity, proclivity, if you will, of, toward making mistakes. And I looked over at her, and 
and tears were just streaming down her face. She was just sitting there quietly sobbing. And I knew that it was going to be a long struggle for her to be able to one day be able to look herself, not just at, in her, excuse me, not just at herself in the mirror, but to within herself. I don't know that she's been able to take herself off that hook yet for whatever it is that she cannot forgive herself for. So what I'm working on with young people is to try and get them to a point where they can accept themselves for their fallibility, where they can like themselves enough to where they can take their own best advice, to respect themselves enough and understand that our mistakes, as well as our successes, our mistakes, as well as our achievement, define us. All of our experiences define who we are. And I'm hoping that she'll get there one day. So let me conclude my remarks by saying that I spent way too many years of my life below the surface. And in coming to a point where I can live my life above the surface,